This January, I finally picked up Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass. Now, the reason I waited so long to get this game is because I was basically waiting for a plane ride to Europe that ended up never happening, and I wanted to have a Zelda game to play on the plane ride. And ironically, when I ended up buying uh, Phantom Hourglass, it was for a train ride, and by then, uh, Spirit Tracks already came out. And the reason I wanted to go to the UK was to check out the trains, so it's kind of ironic that I ended up playing uh, Phantom Hourglass on a train and not on the way to see trains. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I uh, started playing it, and I have a lot of thoughts about it. It really made me think a lot about just how Zelda sort of evolved. Now, I was actually, for a while, I know my friend gave his impressions, and he actually said he did not like Phantom Hourglass at all, and he, because of that he had no interest in Spirit Tracks, and I was kind of surprised because I know Pete likes Zelda, so I was really was kind of worried that the controls were, or the gameplay was just very awful and unplayable. And for the first hour, I, as much as I wanted to really get into it, I really wanted to hate it. But after the first mini dungeon, the fire mini dungeon. I started to get into it and appreciate it a little more. You really want to use the touchscreen with the DS. This game really lets you use it a lot. It uses the touchscreen really well. It's still kind of clunky in a way. It's not as good as pressing buttons. It works. It's a great use of the touchscreen, but it's, is it better than pressing buttons? No. And at the same time, if I could have had it just being, you know, like the D-pad style traditional controls, I probably wouldn't have gone back to that either. It's just, something about it just feels a little off, but it's still, you want to use it, and it's kind of fun to use it. Now, the, the, the use of the upper map screen is very, very excellent. I really love how they did, they really validated the use of the second screen or the existence of the second screen on the system. Now, there are some points where I like being able to pull down the screen, the map screen, and draw on it to uh, make little notes, but there's some times where it may, sort of makes you do it, and it's really kind of gimmicky. It feels sort of forced. It's like, yes, it's a good thing, but you don't have to force the player to take notes of things every opportunity you have the chance to do so. Now, about the graphics and the style of the gameplay itself, it's sort of top-down style. Back when... N64 came out. I, I've been gaming since like the very, like, 92 with the Game Gear, and then I got Game Boy, and then eventually I got N64. That, and N64 was my first home system, and I had lots of exposure to the home systems at my friend's house and so on. And But in the magazines, I really didn't understand what they meant by Nintendo took the bold move to the bold decision to move Mario into 3D, the bold decision to move Zelda into 3D. I was like, well, of course, what else? And that's the obvious choice. That's you know what else could they have possibly done to move his N64? And now, with when I'm now seeing Super Mario Brothers DS, and seeing how they made Phantom Hourglass like 3D, but in the sort of this top-down style of the old ones, not really a free-roaming, uh, free-roaming camera, free-roaming environment in 3D with Zelda, it really shows how that could have been what Ocarina of Time could have been like. They could have been conservative at Nintendo and said, okay, we're going to have it in 3D, but we're going to make it in the style of Link to the Past. So it, it, now I really do see how it was a bold decision to make it that full free-roaming free 3D like they did for Ocarina of Time. And it shows sort of an alternate way the Zelda series could have evolved and how gaming itself could have evolved. Because who... How, Mario 64 did so much for 3D game design, it's almost immeasurable what, how much longer that those elements and those concepts would have taken to evolve had that not come along when it did. Now, it was sort of a surprise, because when, you, when, you, when the DS was first announced, it was sort of taken as to be, like the DS would be to the N64, as the Game Boy Advance was to the Super NES, with lots of ports and the same styles of games and everything. So, of course, I me and probably lots of others imagined an Ocarina of Time style offering, if not a straight up port of Ocarina of Time, which I'm glad didn't happen. But when it comes to the the gameplay and how it would use, I was expecting something like Ocarina of Time or Joy's Mask. So it was really interesting to see how they took the Wind Waker art style and applied it to a sort of a new take on a 3D Zelda with the 2D top down style. And it's 
I like it. I like that. I'd like that. Now, when it comes to the music, there, I'm very underwhelmed, very disappointed with the music. When I first went out on the on the first island you land on and you go into sort of that wild area where there are a few choo choos, there are a few basic enemies around, and you hear that dun 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 theme, like I thought that was sort of like gonna be the beginning of the theme, but no, it's just like that dun 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 repeating over and over and over. And I'm like, okay, that's sort of like a good sort of theme for like you know, the first area of the game where you fight, face enemies, but no, that's the theme for every island outside of the town. It's like every single island in the in the game so far. I'm like up to like the fire mini dungeon, I know the wind mini dungeon now, the wind temple thing. But um, why is that? That's ridiculous. That's so lazy, Nintendo. That's even worse than the when I was complaining about the new Super Mario Bros. DS theme being used in New Super Mario Bros. Wii. It's even worse than that. It's just, it's not even music. It's just dun 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 dun. It's like the stupid theme in uh, the NES version of Back to the Future. It's like over and over and over. And it's it's unacceptable. It's lazy. I mean, the 8-bit Game Boy had on Link's Awakening every it was the first Zelda game where every I mean even then it had the full overworld theme you know of, from the NES and Super NES I mean just use the the old classic overworld theme for when you're exploring the land and then have the theme for when you're on the ocean and the steamboat that's not too hard to figure out you have the Zelda theme it's, it's in almost every other game anyway so why not just throw it in for, for while you're exploring the wild areas on the islands. And there were, there was no music when you're exploring the islands in Wind Waker, but that works very well because it was very atmospheric. You could hear the wind rushing and the, the, the water crashing against the waves and, you know, the creaking of your, your boat on the other side of the island, on the small island. It was really atmospheric. This one, you need to, with the DS, you know, you can't really see the ocean around you. You're looking straight down on the land. So you need, you need some music. But just that dun 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 theme, that's not even a theme, it's just lazy. And another thing I'm very disappointed in, the music for the mini dungeons in the caves, it's like dun 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 dun, that theme, it's like, that. it's very reminiscent of the cave theme from Link to the Past, which is cool, you know, it's for its use in the caves, but it's also used in the mini dungeons. Which, uh, okay, but it's it's in every single dungeon that I've played through so far. I'm guessing it's in all four, because when I downloaded the track to put in this video, it just says dungeon theme, and that's ridiculous. Link, Link to the... No, Link's Awakening on the 8-bit Game Boy, once again. That was the first Zelda game where every dungeon had its unique theme. So why could they not do that for Phantom Hourglass? Were they just being lazy? Were they... Were they pressed for time? It's, it's not a, it's so it's not like this is some random some third party developer or some just some random game. It's it's Zelda from Nintendo. They they pour their their best talent and resources into making Zelda games and to recycle music and not even neither of the themes that repeat neither of them are particularly good. They're just sort of little repeating ditties. Like, that's something I'd expect on the Super Nintendo, and even the Super Nintendo didn't have that. I mean, I mean, the Game Boy didn't have that, and that was an 8-bit system, so it's really not acceptable that the music is being recycled that way. Now, going off the music, now about the fact how they restructured the dungeons, how they, they have that one central dungeon, and then you have those, you know, like the wind du dungeon and the fire dungeon. I haven't played through most of the games, so it's really cool. It's really nice to sort of break away from the traditional, you know, going into each dungeon that's been the, the the structure since the first Zelda. And I'm really excited how they're, supposedly they're going to really shake up that old dungeon overworld town structure in the next Zelda game for Wii, and I'm really excited about that. But there's a rumor that there's going to be a new DS at this year's E3. But I really hope they allow themselves to go into the more 3D free-roaming style. It's not that I don't dislike the Phantom Hourglass Spirit Tracks style, but it's, don't limit yourself to that just because that works. Those are my impressions on Phantom Hourglass, and they're probably not going to change much, and I'm probably going to enjoy it through the rest of the game. My Overall, my opinions are very positive, but those little things that I keep mentioning, it's very irritating. So, thank you very much for watching.